Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dennis Marshall. Uh, he is a professor of theology here at Aquinas. He's been here for 14 years now. Uh, teaches classes that focus on more of the philosophical end of things as well, such as wrestling with God. He teaches courses on Christian marriage, uh, Christology, which unfortunately is the only class I took with him. It's my one class I took with him. And uh, he gave me a B minus on a paper. Um, <laughs> That dropped me to a B plus in the class because I heard he never gave out A's. I thought I was going to beat the system, and he didn't let me do that. But he remind, reminded me this morning that I deserve that B minus, and I still have the paper, and, and I do. I deserve that. <laughs> uh, Dr. Marshall has a PhD from Duquesne uh, University. Uh, he is a member of the Catholic Studies Department here at Aquinas. There is a little bit of information on the, in the back, back, back corner of the room. Uh, check that department out. It's a phenomenal department here at Aquinas. Uh, so he teaches uh, classes for that department. He is also the advisor for the students, uh, students for Life here on campus. And he will be speaking uh, to us today on the papal encyclical, Humani Vitae, on human life. Join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Marshall. Thanks, Mark. But given great inflation, you probably deserved a D minus on that. So uh, anyway, I want to um, want to thank um, Eric and um, for inviting me, uh, giving this opportunity to speak about um, one of my favorite topics, which is sex, and um, especially dealing with humani vitae. I'm especially grateful too to Dr. Pastana's presentation on um, natural law because. Um, he has given the, the perfect foundation to be able to understand, really, what um, Pope Paul VI was trying to accomplish in his writing in Humanae Vitae way back in 1968. If you can see, I drew um, on, redrew on the board his uh, view of the acorn and the tree and the dynamic orientation of the acorn to become a tree. And then I drew man and woman, the symbol for man and woman above that. Now, marriage has its own intrinsic ordination. Hmm? it is perfected in an ultimate end. Not to be a tree, of course, that would be the squirrely thing. However, in this particular context in which um, Dr. Pastana rightly points out that given an evolutionary view and given the existential assertions by people like Sartre, there's no nature to anything. So that means that we are able to define anything the way that we want it. And this, uh, this idea that we can define uh, marriage and sex the way that we want to is a great source of our confusion today, not to mention a great um, signifier of our perversity. Just like the acorn has a context in an, an environment in which it is, um, uh, in which its um, ultimate goal is facilitated, so too does human sexuality have an environment in which the ultimate goal, both natural and supernatural, are accomplished. That environment in which sexuality flourishes and achieves its proper end is marriage. And marriage has the goal, two, two natural goals, we might say. First and foremost, sexuality um, in marriage is ordered to the rearing and education of children. Secondly, it is to foster the perfection of the social life, which uh, Dr. Pastana so um, cogently laid out in his um, talk. And then thirdly, it is also um, intended to facilitate our union with God. I would like you to remember those points because I am going to return to them uh, at the end and, uh, and uh, comment briefly about them in light of our discussion of Humanae Vitae. Now in chapter 17, or rather not chapter 17, but paragraph 17 of uh, Humanae Vitae, Pope Paul VI predicts what is going to happen if contraceptive methods and contraceptive mentality become um, normal, if you will, for our society. And I know since you didn't, um, y'all didn't um, read up on your Humanae Vitae yesterday before you went to bed, I'm going to reread that section for you um, in this sense. He says this, beginning in number 17, and I quote, upright men can even better convince themselves of the solid grounds on which the teaching of the church in this field is based 
if they care to reflect upon the consequences of methods of artificial birth control. Let them consider, first of all, how wide and easy a road would thus be opened up towards conjugal infidelity and the general lowering of morality. Not much experience is needed in order to know human weakness and to understand that men, especially the young, who are so vulnerable on this point, have need of encouragement to be faithful to the moral law so that they must not be offered some easy means of eluding its observance. It is also to be feared that the man, growing used to the employment of anticonceptive practices, may finally lose respect for the woman and no longer caring for her physical and psychological equilibrium may come to the point of considering her as a mere instrument of selfish enjoyment and no longer as his respected and beloved companion. Let it be considered also that a dangerous weapon would thus be placed in the hands of those public authorities who take no heed of moral exigencies. Who would blame a government for applying to the solution of the problem of the community those means acknowledged to be um, lawful for married couples in the solution of family problems? Who will stop rulers from favoring um, the, uh, who will stop rulers from favoring from even imposing upon their peoples if they were to consider it necessary the method of contraception which they judge to be the most efficacious? In such a way, men wishing to avoid individual fam family or social difficulties encountered in the observance of the divine law would reach the point of placing at the mercy of the intervention of public authorities the most personal and most reserved sector of conjugal intimacy. Now those of you who are careful observers of the culture in which we live could immediately call to mind every violation of those things, or should I say every manifestation of those perversions that have, um, uh, that were enumerated in uh, the paragraph I just read. Now back in 2008, when um, uh, Humanae Vitae celebrated its 40th anniversary, there were a flurry of articles that um, uh, were written by both Catholic and non-Catholic authors that actually, um, uh, congratulated or were amazed, if you will, uh, at least for the non-Catholic um, authors, the secular press were amazed that the predictions made by Paul VI in 1968 had in fact actually, had actually become true. Why is that? Because in 1968, when Paul VI predicted all the serious consequences that would flow from a um, contraceptive mentality, we now unfortunately have the um, uh, sociological data backing up those predictions and in fact proving Paul VI to be true. We live in an age then, ladies and gentlemen, in which w uh, we might even uh, express a woe to ourselves in which good has become evil and evil has become good. So confused have we become about matter sexual and uh, about the nature of marriage and so on and so forth. One of the best articles, and I suggest you read it, you might be able to find it um, accessible online, is the article by Mary Eberstadt, written for um, the journal First Things back in the September issue, 2008. The title of that, um, title of that um, essay is called The Vindication of Humanae Vitae. And the rest of my comments about uh, the vindication of Humanae Vitae are drawn in part from her observations, but of course um, uh, they're going to be elaborated on in my own inimitable style. Just to call your, um, just to call again to your memory, hmm. Paul VI's predictions are this. There's going to be a lowering of moral standards in society. There is going to be a rise in infidelity there's going to be a lessening of respect for women by men, and there's going to be government coercion to use reproductive technologies. Let me deal with the government coercion using um, reproductive technologies. 
if we look to the former Soviet Union and the present-day communist China, we can see those kind of things, in fact, played out. And nobody 40-some-odd um, years ago would have ever thought that the United States would be in such a position in which the individual freedoms of, um, uh, of a man and woman with regard to their um, uh, with regard to their sexuality would be um, attempt to be regulated by government. But all of us know in here that given Obamacare and given the regulations that are going to be put in place if that in fact ever comes through, then Catholic hospitals are going to be forced to provide anti-conceptive services, uh, perhaps even um, services with regard to abortion. So even within the context of our own um, contemporary time, the threat of government imposing upon us these kind of um, actions that are contrary to the natural moral law and therefore contrary to the divine law are something, is something that is quite real and is something that we ought to be um, concerned about. Now why is it that government, why is it that Americans would allow government to step in to that, um, into that situation, and even put us in a situation in which um, such, uh, such immoralities imposed on us as goods, hmm, how do we find ourselves in that situation? We find ourselves in that situation because we're already confused about the meaning of sexuality, about its goal, and about the nature of marriage. And if it wasn't for that confusion, we would not have a government stepping in thinking that it can, by its own fiat, resolve the confusions that are part of our own social structure. But these confusions go back, and they're not rooted necessarily in a, um, a social vision of things, but rather more in a personal vision of things that, um, that was fostered by the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Oh, we don't even have to go back that far, uh, or go, go there, or stop there. We could go back to 1930 at the Lambeth Conference when the Anglicans allowed spouses, Christian spouses, to use artificial contraception in order to limit, um, in order to limit the family size back in 1930. If there's any um, demonstration of an argument for a slippery slope in which one thing gives way to another inevitably, it is the loosening of the restrictions uh, and the abandoning of the traditional teaching about such things as um, abortion and um, contraception by Christians that have led to, in part, the serious confusion that we experienced since the 60s and that have, in fact, steamrolled since that, from that point onward down to our present moment. So let's look at the lowering of moral standards because it's Christians that began to lower the moral standards. And we ought to be able to see those in society. Somebody correct me, is it, is, it, is it the Catholic Church the only one that still maintains a traditional teaching against abortion and against artificial contraception? Or is there some other um, Christian denomination holding the line that I am not aware of? It's only Catholics as far as I know, and um, if, I guess if you count Mormons as Christians, they would be holding that line, okay? In that particular respect, right, if you just look to our brothers and sisters in these other denominations, the Lutheran Church in America, for example, the Presbyterian Church, USA, and so on and so forth, their greatest art, even the Anglican Church, which is, began to be fragmented, I believe, in 2005 over this precise um, issue, is the definition of marriage, the rights of homosexual marriage, et cetera, et cetera. The lowering of morality within the Christian churches, the loss of the standard within the Christian churches, has led to a, a kind of easing of moral standards even with this, within the society that we live. Now, for example, the sociological data that says that there's a lowering of moral standards can be, um, by, be identified in the very fact that um, back in the 1960s, hmm, Kissing one's date goodnight at the door hmm, began to be even um, uh, more exciting because parents were even allowing their children to engage in sexual intimacy within their own house. 
because of the easing of um, uh, prohibitions against premarital sex, illegitimate um, pregnancies have skyrocketed. Abortions have skyrocketed as well, and even economists back in um, uh, have been making arguments of why illegitimate births and um, uh, abortions would um, would would become more predominant, even according to economic law. We're confused about the goal of sexuality. We treat it more like, um, in our culture today, we treat it more as a type of um, entertainment rather than an expression of love or commitment or fidelity. All of those other more important elements that were connected with sexual expression that we have, in fact, lost today. So much so that, for example, when my daughter, um, she's 27 now, when she went to her first dance, um, when she was 16 years old, I think it was homecoming, and her date came over, she ran up and showed him how wonderful her dress was, and this dress was an open bag dress. And um, I said, now show, show your date this dress, because, and, and, he, and oh yeah, it's very beautiful, and it was, and my daughter looked beautiful in it. And, and then I told him this, I said, you touch her back, her bare back, I'm breaking your fingers. Well, my students react to the, that kind of thing as if, oh, how prudish. No, not how prudish. I understand what human weakness is. I understand what uh, the culture promotes in contradiction to the well-being of my daughter as well as the young man who, whom she was dating at the time. I recognize those things, and if we do not, um, and if we do not put a fence around, hmm, those very important dimensions of our existence with regard to sexuality, and we fence them in th with um, uh, the disciplines of abstinence and the virtue of chastity, then it's inevitably the case that we are going to um, uh, fall, really, to the lie of the contemporary culture and the easy sensuality that it promotes. Now, I don't have to spend any more time on that. That's one of the most obvious ones. Hmm? But what about the fact of infidelity? I teach the marriage course here at Aquinas, and um, over the course of the past 12 years of my teaching this course, one of, my, one of the increasing concerns of my students is the infidelity of spouses. Why would this be? Because anybody who knows when they engage in a particular behavior, how that very, that very behavior becomes um, very much a part of our character, and how difficult um, a habit becomes to break, especially if it's a bad habit or a vice. Is everybody with me? Somehow my students think that after engaging in serial um, uh, premarital affairs, that when they stand before the justice of the peace or the minister and they say the vows in which they pledge their fidelity and commitment to this one particular person for the rest of their life, that somehow that's going to magically break the habit of serial infidelity, serial um, premarital um, relationships, and so on and so forth. And guess what? It does not do that. The vows do not do that. And so both men and women are afraid more than anything else of the infidelity of the spouse. And yet what they want more than anything else is precisely the fidelity that they themselves have not been able to live through the expression of their own sexual actions prior to that point. The sexual revolution and the contemporary culture which promotes the idea that it's no big deal to sleep with as many partners as you want is in fact a big deal. And it's a, even a big deal for my students who by and large have drank, drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and have, sec, have accepted the mores of that kind of uh, the, uh, the society's loose view of sexual mores.
Furthermore, we see a decrease sociologically, we see a decrease in marriage. People are getting married later. Why are they getting married later? In part because there's this open um, sexual marketplace in which you can indulge whatever fantasy you like without foregoing the responsibilities that are entailed in the marriage vows. It should be not be surprising to us that um, people who um, uh, support abortion are found in the age range between 18 and 35. Men are the ones who support abortion. Who knew? And why would that? Because it serves their sexual interest to do so. It makes it possible for them to engage in what I can consider to be um, seriously um, flawed behavior and to arrive at a defini definition of masculinity that is precisely the, the type that we would consider to be the vicious man who simply defines, um, defines things according to what he desires and the satisfaction of those desires is merely what is good. Now this de decrease in marriage hmm, is going to have a subsequent increase in father, uh, fatherless families. And fatherless families, as you know, anybody who's been paying attention for the last 40 years knows that the demise of the American family is, a, um, uh, is directly causing the screwed up social order we now have. Children need two parents and they need a father. Sociological studies indicate that the single um, uh, greatest contributing factor to the success of their children, whether it's male or female, is an actively involved father in the family. What have we got? We have got absentee fathers who are not um, uh, involved in their family, and we have, especially among men, a high rate of criminal activity, there's a greater number of arrests, there's a greater number of prison time, there's a greater num uh, level of substance abuse and so on and so forth. All these negative indicators can be traced to, back to the fact of absentee fathers within the family. And because the family is the basic social unit of society, if the family is disordered, the society is going to be disordered. And the thing is, is that once a, once a um, disordered society then begins to um, think within a disordered culture, what it thinks are the solutions are actually disordered solutions which simply contribute further to the problems. Not only have we lost in that respect, not only are we confused about sexuality and the nature of marriage, for example, we're even confused about what it is and means to be human. And if we would know that, or we would get back to those fundamental roots, then we would be able to analyze, as Dr. Pastana pointed out, how it is that we can then direct through the exercise of virtue, through fasting and prayer and abstinence, how we can direct our lives in such a way that corresponds with that which is highest in us and corresponds to our dignity as persons. We have divorce, increased level of divorce. Used to be that divorces took five years because the, so, the society in which we lived is invested in preserving the stability of the family. In the 1960s, with no-fault divorce, in which you could get a divorce in as little as six months, this, this kind of activity actually um, encouraged the breakdown of the family. There have been studies done over the effects of divorce on children and families over the course of 20 years. I can't remember the name of that study right at the moment. But what, what interested me in reading that study is that the parents who were interviewed, the ones who wanted the divorce, are the ones who said it would have been better to have stayed married. Fidelity is always better than whatever is on the other side of the fence. 
Moreover, they realized after they did get a divorce that what they divorced over were things that were as um, uh, simple and incidental as dirty socks laying around. Nothing serious like abuse, by and large. Nothing serious like alcoholism or anything like that, but little nitpicky things that children know how to get over when they're playing in the sandbox. That's not my view. That's the view of the divorcees who have subsequently remarried. Furthermore, in light of this family breakdown, in which we are um, encouraged to think that divorce is no big deal, it's also the case, the studies have been done, that families who use, that the parents who use contraceptive methods are more likely to, vo to divorce than those who don't. And I should um, qualify that, those who use artificial contraceptive methods are more likely to divorce than those who say use natural family planning. Those, actually, those statistics are actually there. And so it seems, right, that even the use of uh, a contraceptive mentality is already a kind of a um, disease that eats at and undermines the marital vows and makes it um, very difficult in an already difficult situation to fulfill those vows. Now, there are other things that are indicative of this sociologically and perhaps from um, an odd sector, and that is from the feminists. If you read Friedan, if you read um, uh, other um, feminists, um, you will see this. It's, you will see complaints, grievances, um, Eberstadt calls them, recriminations, and sexual discontent in their writing. If feminists marry and have children, they complain because they're oppressed in the um, comfortable concentration camp of the suburb. If they did not marry and have children, they not only complain, but they lament as if they have experienced a loss. If they marry, and they have children and they work outside the home, they complain because of the burdensome nature of that life. It's very difficult. If they work out the side the home and don't tend to their children, then anybody who says, well, maybe you ought to um, you know, um, tend to your children, they excoriate them for being sexist and patriarchally oppressive and so on and so forth. Hmm? Even in feminist writing, in other words, there is this discontent of disorder, that something is out of whack, that something needs to be fixed. Now, what I don't see in feminist literature is that one of the things that they promote as um, essential pillars of feminism, namely free and easy access to um, contraception and abortion, it's precisely those things that undermine a vision of marriage that they would see as more fulfilling and complete. Why would that be the case? Well, it seems to me that um, uh, contraception has allowed women to act in a way sexually, behaviorally, or, uh, behaviorally as men, right? Men are the ones who are the serially prom, uh, promiscuous. Women who suffer the consequences of that promiscuity through pregnancy are less likely to, um, were less likely to um, engage in that kind of behavior because of the serious consequences of the life that resulted from it. But now, artificial contraception has in fact made it possible for women to enter into serial promiscuous relationships and thus behave like men. Not only were we confused about marriage, not only were we confused about sexuality, but men, but women have become men sexually because of the pill, right? And well, I hate to point out the fact that, you know, in this day and age, men have become more feminized to where you can't hardly tell the difference between them. We're confused in that arena as well. Now, all of these things, who's got the time, by the way, huh? I've got five minutes, thank you, okay. 
Now, all of these things point to the, fa to the fact that we suffer from a problem. In 1968, Pope Paul VI recognized that we would have a problem if we continued down that road. What is the solution to the problem? Well, the solution to the problem is, as he points out in um, uh, paragraph number eight, he talks about the notion of love. If it's true that sexuality requires an environment of marriage in order to achieve its appropriate end, and that appropriate end is the care and nurturing of the children, the stability of the family, the social friendship, that special form of friendship between a husband and wife who share every aspect of life together, and then ultimately uh, uh, that, um, that caring and nurturing of children, that special friendship between them, also contributes to their perfection with regard to their ultimate end, that is holiness, then the virtue that governs that is the virtue of love. And love is not sensuality. It's not merely libido and sexual expression. Love is the willing of the good of the other for his or her own sake. When we enter into the contract of marriage or the covenant of marriage, we are pledging to love the other in such a way that we will contribute to their perfection. And reciprocally, the, their love for us will contribute to our perfection. And seen in light of our ultimate goal, which is communion with God, then marriage becomes the boot camp, if you will the hothouse in which we learn to love as in no other institution. We learn how to love our neighbor as ourselves through self-denial, through willing self-sacrifice for family, spouse, etc. All of that is implied in the vows and the meaning of love with the institution of marriage. Contemporary world in which we live and its attitudes towards sexuality and marriage are antithetical to that. This makes Catholicism countercultural for all you 60s revolutionaries. And in that particular respect then, in order for us to achieve our ultimate perfection in God, in order for us to achieve our human perfection naturally, then we must live with our sexuality in a manner that corresponds with that nature. It's a nature that perfects us with regard to friendship and socially to one another, with regard to the self-sacrifice in raising our children well, and ultimately regard with our final end insofar as it helps fashion us more and more into the likeness of Christ himself. When we live that in that fashion, then the well-ordered household, the well-ordered relationship acts like a ripple from a, um, a rock in a pond and radiates for, out from that and actually transforms society. And the meaning of love and the understanding of marriage and the understanding of sexuality as the Catholic Church teaches it in light of divine and natural law, when it's lived well by us, we who have been charged to live out its obligations, then we, through our witness and our testimony of our very lives, transform the society, bring the society, society good, good news that it very much needs at this moment. And since I have two minutes left, I will end on that particular note. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.